Over the last couple of years, the term metaverse has effectively infiltrated corporate strategy, sparked consumer ambitions and triggered billions of dollars of investor money. While big tech companies started to recalibrate their metaverse strategies recently, leading manufacturing companies increasingly rely on virtual twins to evolve them into industrial virtual worlds. They build extended ecosystems to simulate products, experiences, and entire factories, before they even exist in the real world. There are new challenges and opportunities. Does the metaverse impact product development? Can virtual twins help companies to enhance consumer experience? How can industries leverage new capabilities to build a more sustainable future? Dasso System talks to experts from around the world to spark new ideas and innovation. Live from the 3D Experience Lab in Munich. Hello everybody, my name is Fabien. We are here at the 3D Experience Lab Munich, my favorite place for inspiration and innovation. So, welcome back to my living room for 3D Excite Live. My name is Matthias. Great to have all of you with us, here in Munich, but as well around the world. Once, they say, it's an accident. Twice, it's coincidence. But three times 3D Excite Live, this is a series. Again, we assembled a fantastic lineup. One of this, few of the smartest people in that field are going to share their unique insights with us on what's called the industrial metaverse. Now we need someone to lead the conversation, right? Of course we do. So let's invite the person on stage who is going to lead today's panel. Here she comes, Raj. Thank you, Fabi. Thank you, Matthias. Thank you, Matthias and Fabian, and hello, everyone, and welcome to the first of the 3D Excite Live series for 2023. My name is Raj Heyer, and I am delighted to be back as the host this evening. We are speaking about industrial virtual worlds, experience simulation for real-world impact. Now, if you're questioning about what does that mean, don't fret. We've got four fantastic experts who are going to share their knowledge, their insights, and hopefully inspire you in your organization. If you do feel inspired, please feel free to take a photo if you're live, take a screenshot if you're online, and share it on LinkedIn or Twitter. Just don't forget to use our hashtag, 3D Excite Live. And without further ado, let's get the panel up on stage. First, we have Senior Vice President Europe for Nokia Enterprise, Mathieu Bergognon. Welcome. No please have a seat. From Fraunhofer Gesellschaft, we have Senior Research Manager, Dr. Dietmar Lass. Our resident technologist and metaverse expert, Dirk Songer. And last but definitely not least, our Dassault Systems representative, Vice President, of industrial equipment industry, Philippe Bartisol. Now, after our discussion, there will be time for questions, so please prepare the most difficult ones you can for our panel, because they can answer them. So everyone get comfy and let's settle in. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hello. Everyone comfortable? Yeah, Excellent. So over the last couple of years, we keep hearing this term metaverse, what we're referring to as virtual worlds. It is infiltrating corporate strategy, billions of dollars of investment. And then when I talk about industrial metaverse, I hear it's been around for 40, 50 years. Is that true, Philippe? Is it business as usual? Absolutely. Actually, for Dassault Systems since exactly 1981, because since then, we've been providing our customers with engineering twins that are, in essence, metaverses. But when you think about it, the engineering metaverse, you develop the next generation product for four, five, six years. Then you put it on the market. You would need to market it, so you might have a marketing twin. And then you get your first quotations. You need a cost, um, um, quoting twin or a commercial twin. Mm -hmm. And then hopefully you get a, a purchase order. And after that, you install. And for the next 20, 30 years, that piece of equipment will stay in the field. So 
I really believe that the biggest opportunity that uh, we have right now is to provide our customers with um, metaverses or virtual twins in operation of the actual piece of equipment, the specific twin for that equipment with that serial number at that customer location. I mean, that already sounds like a call to action in the future of the metaverse, doesn't it? Um, so really, it's evolving and changing. And Dietmar, I mean, you work for the world's leading organization for application-oriented uh, research. Is it a topic agenda for you when it comes to education, politics, research? Um, thank you. As you might, <coughs> might know, uh, Fraunhofer um, is a research company um, based in Munich, by the way. <laughs> But we are decentralized, so we have uh, 76 institutes being sort of profit centers. And I work for a group representing 21 research institutes in the field of ICT. So these 21 companies, 21 research institutes, they work for, for in metaverse technologies for years, in AI, in digital twins and 5G and whatever. But as a large research society, we also care about societal topics, agenda setting and stuff. Mm -hmm. and so we made this topic metaverse or industrial metaverse as a key roadmap topic. We're going to open up the floor in a minute, but Matthew, I wanted to specifically talk to you because you have uh, expertise in transport, engineering, mm -hmm. energy, uh, public safety, manufacturing, logistics. But some people might be questioning, Nokia is important, how important it is for Nokia actually to discuss the metaverse and what role you're playing in the development of metaverse. So I'd love if you could just introduce it to the yeah. audience. Yeah, thank you for this question because um, Nokia is known for the business that we do with service providers, but we have uh, developed a very strong expertise in all the segments that you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. And uh, Nokia uh, design, builds and maintains network and applications for, to enable the industry for the zero. And uh, we have two great examples that we'll, I'm sure, discuss uh, in the next minutes. It's, um, we have solutions for 5G industrial grade uh, mobile networks, mm -hmm. and also everything regarding um, industry edge cloud platforms. So 5G, this is low latency, massive throughput for data collection, and uh, edge cloud platform, this is for um, local processing of any data that we need, like video analytics, etc. Excellent, thank you. Thank you very much. Dirk, set the stage. During our conversation, you said the metaverse is on the downturn on the hype cycle. I think probably you need to explain a little bit about the hype cycle first, but we'd love to hear why do you think it's on the downturn, and then let's open it up and everyone can jump in. <laughs> Um, I, I think, first provocation of the day, um, I think the metaverse is on a downturn on the hype cycle, and I think that's a good thing. So in, in terms of hype cycle, there's something interesting happening um, where the, the value of a technology around a narrative detaches from the actual um, usefulness of the technology. So useful, usually we think about technology in terms of what does it do for me? It's a tool. Uh, how does it make me more efficient? Um, how does it save me time? How does it make me money ultimately as an individual, but also as, a, as an organization? And in hype cycles, a topic or technology transcends that view where it doesn't necessarily need to, to serve that purpose to be useful to me. Mm -hmm. I can, for example, on, on, on the very extreme of things, I can create a press release that I'm doing something with the metaverse as an organization and it will give me access to more resources, for example, by increasing my stock price or getting me access to new talents. And that has nothing to do with a use case per se. And so in these hype cycles, you can, as, a, as, a, as an organization, you can familiarize with new topics, new things, new technologies without them having a concrete um, effect on the bottom line. And then later you're integrating that as it comes to the downturn, it becomes incubation, it becomes innovation, it starts more and more being relevant to the core business of the organization. And then hopefully being int uh, integrated again. So in terms of the, in terms of the downturn, we're, s we're, we're, we're stopping talking breathlessly about the metaverse and finally focusing on what does it actually do for people? What does, it, uh, what does it do for people? What does it enable people to do? What does it enable organizations to do? Especially in a global recession, organizations think about how to, how, how to do more with less. Mm -hmm. um, 
And as we go into this downturn, we finally start this conversation around what does it do for people, and especially in, 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 in the industrial context, um, how does it affect my bottom line as an organization? Fantastic. And with you, go ahead. Yeah, I like what Dirk was saying because uh, in Nokia we see in our strategy vision for 2030 that there are three metaverses. There is the consumer metaverse, the enterprise metaverse, and the industry metaverse. So consumer metaverse, this is everything regarding gaming, entertainment. The in enterprise uh, metaverse is immersive collaboration. Mm -hmm. So the super teams or the super Zoom. And industrial metaverse is, uh, as we believe and we see today, huh, this is probably the one surviving the hype on the market. And uh, people say that uh, it will be a business in uh, 2030 of uh, something like between 100 and 200 billion dollars. Mm -hmm. So this is big. And uh, as it was said by Philip, they have already uh, uh, foot in the door, I would say, because uh, with virtual twins, this is uh, one of the essential pieces of the metaverse. Yeah, excellent. But for virtual twins, the um, virtual reality, VR and AR, augmented reality, will be important. So how, where would you situate VR and AR on the hype cycle? I think the point is all of those are on different tracks of maturity, different, um, different velocities as well, where the consumer metaverse is still far out, right? And as this hype cycle recedes, we will not see much of it staying. There, there are a couple of interesting of things in gaming. Price of the device, maybe, you know? Price of the device, accessibility, but also social maturity and accept, uh, acceptance in, in, in societies. For enterprise, we are, we're seeing some very interesting things, but maybe it's the next hype cycle that we see around the metaverse where enterprise is really picking up. And for industrial, um, there will be things that stay. For example, VR and AR. But also, these are in different maturities. For example, VR is pretty mature. We can see that in an industrial use case. We can use it for training. We can use it, for, for example, for safety inspections without ever visiting a factory floor. We can, we can go and visit the factory doing safety trainings, doing, um, doing approvals for, uh, for, for um, changing the factory floor. AI is interesting. It's not as mature. It's very niche, very focused use cases, for example, around remote assistance, for example, in, in especially in first-line worker and, and maintenance crews. But it's still hard. There's, there are certain limitations, for example, in field of view, in, in, in visibility, in low light um, uh, situations where there are limits what we can do. So it's maybe not usable in any industrial context. There might be safety concerns, security concerns, those kind of things. But we're seeing these things mature, um, mature a lot. Dietmar, you wanted to mention something? Um, yeah, the last point. I mean, some people. Um, say VR is the same as Metaverse, uh, which is not true. It's even not true to say Metaverse is the same thing as Digital Twin. But I wanted to come to the hype cycles. I mean, we have these Gartner hype cycles yeah, for, for investors and for technology companies. Okay, yeah, then we have the next big thing discussions, what every year comes. This year is not Metaverse, it's ChatGPT and Generative <laughs> AI. Yeah, but. But <clears throat> metaverse technologies are basically old. So VR, AR, or even in some communication techniques that are years, uh, decades old. Yeah? And, but, but what happened now, last year, beside the, the renaming of this company, Meta, eh, Facebook, Meta, is a story behind it which starts now. But people always, or in the public, because they're not good enough if informed by all of us, say, okay, metaverse is a thing about you know, some, some Lego-like avatars uh, um, doing in, in the gaming business, but that's nothing for industry, right? Yeah, that's, that's what people say. The same with 5G, yeah? I mean, I have 5G on my mobile. I mean, I'm, I'm a tech expert, but, but I have the, it's not the right release, yeah? So I don't have bandwidth and stuff, yeah? So the, 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 the discussion in the public yeah. about people say metaverse, that's meta. Yeah, that, that's about gaming and not, nothing more or less, and that's... Yeah. That's why um, this, this hype cycle thing is always, we, we have to um, make more generic marketing for that. Now, you mentioned networks, so I know you want to say something about that. <laughs> exactly. <Yeah. laughs> exactly. <laughs> Tell me, if you, uh, I think Renault was saying a few years ago that they have been uh, very strong in their strategy to, uh, to have their um, uh, metaverse in, uh, in their company. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had something like, uh, at the moment, uh, 8,500 equipment mm -hmm. uh, connected. Uh, to uh, all together and to gather something like uh, one billion of data. So to do this, you, you see that you need uh, much more than the traditional connectivity. Mm -hmm. So you need real time, 
you need uh, all this uh, mission critical or business critical environment that is probably not provided by Wi-Fi. Um, but uh, what I would like to add also on what you just said, and I probably agree with you, I was a couple of weeks ago at the Mobile World Congress in Barcelona, and uh, Metaverse is on the slides of everybody. So you could see uh, IT consulting firms, Metaverse, this is us. In Nokia, we have said Metaverse, this is us. Dassault System was saying Metaverse, this is us. Service <laughs> provider saying Metaverse, this is us. So everybody is doing Metaverse. And now we have companies in our industries, like transportation, etc. and they come to us and they say, OK, so what can we do now? And what is the potential on Metaverse? And I'm sure that we'll have a chance to discuss about that later. Yeah, I hope so. But Philippe, I'd love you to jump in because everyone says that, of course, this is good for industrial. That's the one that's going to stick. Because let's face it, industrial Metaverse is a subset of the larger Metaverse, but a significant one and probably a crucial one. Um, but I wondered, for you, you said operational twin is the opportunity. But you kind of need these networks to be stronger Absolutely. to be able to deliver that, right? Absolutely. Could you please elaborate on that? What, what Mathieu is talking about is orchestrating or enabling the um, uh, communication between the different um, elements of the twin in a production line or in, in a plant, for example. And if you think about it, we, the, the notion of twin is evolving. Before, we were talking about generic twins. In engineering, you, you want to take a journey across diversity and you want to see the twin this way or this way or this way, but you're not talking about a specific customer twin with a serial number. Now our customers are asking us to create twins that are specific to certain machines in a certain location. And since maybe the last two, three years, so this is really the new... Um, request the new demand that is coming from the uh, from the market it's super super interesting mm -hmm. and in the context of a plant for example we need to start first with system of systems because every machine can have a twin you can have the twin of conveyors you can have twins of robots you can have twins of autonomous mobile robots, and you need to orchestrate all this. So you need to start from a system of system standpoint, and I'm sure that Nokia is already very active in that, uh, in that field. On the operational metaverse, I think that this is uh, extremely important because, and maybe I will say something stupid, but you will correct <laughs> me, I'm sure, but uh, a virtual twin, it's a representation of a behavior of a machine, of a system, or a physical asset. But what is super important for our companies, it's to simulate, but also to test in real time the behavior of a machine. So this notion of real time loopback is critical. And you need to do this with massive data only if you have a super reliable connectivity and infrastructure. And this is why in Nokia we believe that we, are, we will play a key role mm -hmm. in the middle of all this ecosystem of players. And uh, as you just said, um, there will be digital twins of a lot of machines. We will need to manage a system of system. But I like to discuss with the Dassault system guys also, because at the moment, we could imagine that also the network will have, will have its own digital twin. Yes. And the digital twin of the network is part of the system of the system yes. of the digital twin. And this is something that is unique that needs to be managed. And, and this is one of our ambitions in Nokia, is to provide digital twin of the network that we deliver. And you need to be able to simulate the network and test the performance exactly. of the network because it's uh, the key element, uh, gluing everything together. Yeah, I mean, partnerships and ecosystems is something that oh, you all brought up when we had our pre-conversation. Dietmar, is that like, uh, from Fraunhofer Gesellschaft standpoint, is that one of your key objectives? Um, my, I mean, for, for us, we have, of, of course, partners in industry and so on. Mm -hmm. But for those large topics, there has to be a new arrangement of partners. We have Dassault. We have Nokia, traditionally a system integrator for, for, for networks and so on, but, but also as a, as a key component in a, in a digital factory. So we team up with other partners specific for the enterprise sector or for the energy sector or for the maintenance sector. Mm -hmm. So in this, this ecosystem, when, when we had the discussion about uh, why now are we talking about the metaverse? And because 
there are some technologies having reached a technology readiness level. And uh, on the other side, coming new players on the market, like NVIDIA with the Omniverse platform, mm -hmm. and the need for industry players to increase operational effectiveness and other KPIs. You, you could, could go on with it. So I just pl pl play the I ball. I see you nodding at her. Play the ball to you now. <laughs> I, I, I think in, in, in terms of partners, the interesting thing, you all talked around technologies and systems of systems, and, and that is great. Ultimately, if we talk about industry customers, they're interested in a very specific KPI. How do I reduce waste by X percent? How do I reduce my energy expenditure? How am I more sustainable by wasting less water or using less water in my, um, in my production process? And, and those are the, the actual things that industrial customers want. They, 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 that's what they require. This is, this is the language they speak. Now, we obviously on the stage can talk the entire day around digital twins, system of systems, computational graphs. It's, it's great to talk yeah, about that. that. <laughs> um, but it's really about the use case. And the issue here is that currently no one partner, there's not a thing that you can put on a table and say, this is delivering the entire value. Instead, it's a lot of partners doing very specific things. That's the STEM, um, Nokia, um, and it's very interesting to, to even look at that. This is where, where, where we need institutes or rather, um, uh, uh, rather networks like, like the Fraunhofer to even come up with those things. What do they actually mean for an organization, but also for a market in itself or for, for a society that these organizations work with? And so the issue is there's not one thing to buy, which means all the partners need to come together to form a coherent yeah. storyline so that it's transactable by, by, by a customer. Because otherwise, what would, a, what would an industrial customer even do? Um, individually, transact with 12 partners, exactly. project management, yeah. do, the, do the RFI for all of those partners somehow get in? No. You give a lot of money to a consultancy that abstracts that. But this is prohibitively expensive. So and it doesn't work. <laughs> and I didn't, I'm sorry to say, yeah. and it doesn't work. Because if I may interrupt you, in, uh, in fact, we see that all these companies would, uh, you cannot buy uh, at Walmart a metaverse. So um, nobody knows how to start with metaverse. I think there was a BCG study was saying that 63% of the interviewed people uh, were saying that they don't know how to start in the metaverse. Mm -hmm. So they will probably need, as you said, um, uh, a certain level of integration to put all things together. Mm -hmm. And there is no company today uh, that I have identified <laughs> that has the level of skills to do this integration. Yeah. And I think this is potentially a roadblock to start uh, implementing uh, the, the industry metaverse in all these companies. So there is an ecosystem of partners, as you said, IT consulting probably very early in the, in the decision process, but integrators, as we said, uh, players like Omron or KUKA, um, but we are not yet there. Philippe, would you agree? Well, there is, um, actually, there, is, there are certain companies that own already part of the digital twin or the metaverse. These are the machine guys, the machine OEMs, and there are so many in the German Mittelstand, actually. When you have a machine maker that is probably also a line builder, because there's no such thing as a standalone machine now. So let's take a, a line builder. He will supply a complete line to a user, to somebody owning a factory and operating a factory. But actually, the issue is that the, the line user is not buying the twin. And this is very surprising because he's buying pieces of mechatronic equipment, services, spare parts, training, and forgets about what about the twin. So what we are now discussing and working at is uh, trying to simplify the twin of the line builder so that he can feel much more confident in either renting or selling part of the twin or the, the entire twin, but a twin that is simplified and beautified in a way so that it's, it's much more serviceable. And we will see more engagements between the 
um, the one who is providing the complete line and the one who is using, because the, the, it, it's not working well right now. We see that the users are trying to do something, but it's not black and white. So if we can find something in the middle with the simplification of the twin, and we're working actively on this at Dassault System, especially with 3D Excite, then I think there's going to be a cooperation. It could be maybe the foundation of um, that uh, ecosystem in the future. Then, this being said, if this works this way, the most important thing thereafter is who updates the twin, the virtual twin or the metaverse? Because if you supply a complete metaverse and you're not upgrading it as the machines are being modified um, day after day, then it's like, like a glass cathedral. It, it doesn't serve any purpose after six months. So who will do that? Dietmar, did you want to jump in? <laughs> I, I certainly don't have an answer. Who's, who's doing the, 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 the software updates? I mean, the idea of the full live digital twin is to have it first tested in the, in, in the virtual twin, yeah? And then go back in time and fix the bug or, or renew, renew it, yeah? But I just put myself into a German industrial Mittelstand in, in Bavaria in Württemberg, not in Berlin, where I come from, we don't have that. But, um, and he's, he's hearing about <laughs> the topics, yeah, and he's hearing about AI and productivity on, 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 the, on the factory floor and on the workers and the Betriebsrate and so on, yeah, and, and where to start with, yeah. He, he wants to digitize, but then it's, it's about data and data interoperability, yeah, and, and data platforms, Gaia X and Cathena X, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it, it's making progress, but... He knows, he doesn't know where to start. And that's, that's the real problem. We have to start with, we, we had this use case thing, and we had this use case, uh, I was going around with 5G use cases for years in, 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 the, in the campus grids, and it was really hard to find those, those ones, yeah? Where 5G was really superior to, to, to industrial Wi-Fi or LoRaWAN or whatever. And with the industrial metaverse, we might have this, 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 the same thing. So there really has to be a cost-benefit ratio and to have very, something very, start with the, the maintenance, the training, or some, some, some digital twin on a, on a machine with rotating parts and then have the benefit. Okay, I definitely want to come back yeah. to some of the advice that you have, calls to action that you've got for organizations, but Mathieu, you had something to add to that, so I'd like to... Yeah, first I invite you at Anovermes because with uh, Dassault System, yeah. we will present our collaboration <laughs> with Omron, and we yeah. will yeah. Uh, demonstrate <laughs> that with 5G, we yeah. can do great things with the AGV providers. But yeah. I think what you said in the world of the ecosystem mm -hmm. and when all these uh, sub-elements need to communicate together, we foresee in Nokia a big value of reflecting in the standardization of uh, all the way the, 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 the system will communicate together. And we know in Nokia we are big fan of communication. Mm -hmm. So that's why we believe that it will be crucial that at the moment to make it real, all these systems have a, um, yeah, a way to, uh, to, to, to collaborate or to work together. Yeah, fantastic. Um, I want to come back to the implications and call to action. And Philippe, we talked about you know the operational twin. It, I mean, that could be the lifetime of the product, which is 30 or 40 years. So where do people start? We come back to this question. Where do they start? If you were thinking about, hey, what's the first step towards really integrating it, what would your advice be? So if you're providing a piece of equipment, you will start from engineering. And this, the, as we said, the twin or the metaverse already exists in, since decades. Mm -hmm. The thing is that, do you want to have a specific twin per order you are taking in order fulfillment and then in the field? And if you do, and if um, you have providers that are enabling you with these twins, then slowly, uh, year after year, not on the, on the uh, install base, but after a certain date, you will build a library of specific twins and you can then project everything that is happening onto that piece of equipment in the field in the next 20 years onto that virtual twin in operation. And I, I think it will happen in after-sales service, if you take it from the OEM standpoint. The same thing that happened 20 years ago in engineering, which is everybody is now working around the 3D twin. Mm -hmm. 
no longer on 2D or in service, in after sale service, I believe it will, the same thing will happen and we will project everything, everything that is happening to the machine onto that twin. It might be that it's not happening to very small pieces of equipment immediately, maybe to the largest pieces of equipment. If I'm, if I'm a Mittelstand company, I'm selling 500 machines per year, I can afford that. If I'm selling maybe 30,000 pumps that are almost alike, maybe not. Although, I think will happen the same thing with the specific twins that happened with the IoT, is that 15 years ago, nobody thought that every small object would be connected. I think we will have virtual twins in operation, specific ones for starting with larger pieces of equipment, but then with smaller pieces of equipment. Actually, that refers directly to you, Dirk, because you did talk about the commoditization of digital twins. So would you expand on that? I, I think it's a question of language, right? What you said makes total sense from a, from a, from a product point of view. But turning the tables a little bit, what the customer is actually interested in, that, that the, the, the owner of that factory is, well, what does it do? Right? What you said is great, but, but here's, the other, here's the other side of the coin. What it actually enables the, the, the factory owner is, oh, you have 5% less downtime of those machines that are enabled like that. They use 6% less energy, and um, the output in terms of quality management will be 10% higher because you're having less waste. That's, that's the thing that we have to talk about because we can, again, this, this group loves to talk about technology because we are <laughs> technologists and stuff, but the, the customer is mostly interested, the people who are actually buying the product to solve a problem are interested in what is the problem, what is the KPI that is moved and by how much. Because only then we can make informed decisions as like innovation manager or CEO of a company to actually compare it against other innovation. Um, programs that I have or generally other, other types of improvements. Mm -hmm. Here's another stat for you. It takes around currently 12 months until a metaverse or industry 4.0 project on average pays for itself. It takes 800 days until you reach scale return on invest. Now granted, it's a huge return on invest. Again, 6% energy or less energy um, is, is a huge number for a lot of companies. Um, but then again, it's a, it's a very long time. So first, we have, to, we have to work on talking about specific KPIs, and then we have to reach the point where we get to cash in on those KPIs quicker than we currently have. And we can only do that by um, building the, the, the tools in a way that are commoditized. And we, we don't talk about innovation so much. And this is also, I think, something that has changed with the recent hype cycle, where um, you mentioned that the technology is now mature enough and we're at the point where the technology actually works. Not in a lab, not on a trade show, but actually works. And not just individual solutions, but the solutions together, where the, 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 the solution is there, the network is there, the, the process is there, and we're at that point in industry. We're, so we're entering a point of commoditization where I can actually start talking about use cases, talk, uh, start talking about use cases that are transactable easily, and not just like, again, um, giving the job to one consultancy that doesn't even do it, but we're, we're entering a stage where certain, <laughs> certain use cases are actually good enough defined to be delivered in weeks and not in months. And then you say you need immediate return on invest. Mm -hmm. And this is, that's, this is what we really have done in the last, uh, the, the entire metaverse industry has done, and we can now offer to customers something very tangible, very quickly deliverable, um, that brings them immediate value with relatively low, low risk. Great. Uh, Dean, you wanted to say something, and then we'll come over to you, Matthew. Yeah, we, we, we had this discussion about where to start. So as a company, you, you, you hear this buzzword, the metaverse, and then you, you should at least understand what it's, what is it, how can you use it in your company, build a strategy, innovation team, whatever, and buy some of those glasses and experiment with them. Um, we're talking about diffusion process. So which industries are affected more or less by the metaverse, so the emerging of, of virtual and the real world. And every industry, let's put it this way, is more enterprise should ask this question. So either if you're in tourism, financial services, building, 
whatever, you should ask this question. We, for example, have have uh, this, 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 this holodeck, uh, some people know it by, by Star, Star Trek. Um, so virtual tourism, you, you put your glasses on or, or some other devices and you pre, you, 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 you go to Côte d'Azur and you feel the breeze and you, you select your hotel afterwards. Yeah? So just have this experience, but it's about immersive experience and that's just start with it. Fantastic, please. I think, again, I'm very aligned with what you just said. We have a customer in, uh, in France who, um, in fact, said, OK, I need, um, uh, I need to do something great in my manufacturing plant. They said, OK, it was a CEO decision. They said, we will have 5G everywhere. And then they said to their teams, what do we do with that now? And the team started to work with a consulting firm uh, about uh, what would be the typical use case that would make sense. And they have found different one, two based on the XR VR, so with uh, glasses, and the others to uh, do uh, the simulation of a physical asset, so a virtual twin. Mm -hmm. So what I just like to say is that um, uh, it has started from a CXO decision, and then the teams have worked with a consulting firm to identify the use case because they were super specific and they are reflected, so at the end, it was a gameplay for a lot of uh, people, like a network service provider, it was an operator, an integrator, an IT consulting firm, mm -hmm. a provider of technology like Nokia. But again, there was a model that worked. So exactly as you said, it started to work and it will grow because we have a tangible use case. Fantastic, Ling, talking about use cases, if you take again that line, that production line in the plant or the whole plant, um, <clears throat> you will have installation, the installation experience. Everything is about experiences. So the installation experience, how do I install the line quicker? Installation and setup can take ages, months. So if I can use virtual twins and train uh, in order to do that much quicker, it's, uh, it's one. Then you will have all the maintenance work. Can I... Um, model the maintenance uh, processes, the work instructions, and the specific work instructions for that machine with the specific spare parts. Then you will have modifications or upgrades. Can I simulate if I, if I need, if I can, I need, or if it is useful, if I have the use case to upgrade that machine, that line, because, it will because the value I'm getting from the line is not enough, anymore, and if I do this modification, this upgrade, maybe I'll get a greater value. Is that bigger than the cost of the upgrade? That you can also simulate on the twin. And the last one will be the dismantling and the recycling, everything maybe 20 years later. So I believe that we already have in operation great use cases, and again, that the after sales service activities will leverage these twins tremendously in the years to come. They've already started in the last two or three years. And, and if you think about it, beside the KPIs, and I, I will conclude there, beside the KPIs, it's a question of business models. Because from the OEM perspective, if you can go towards equipment as a service, line as a service, then you are much more responsible of the line OEE, overall equipment efficiency. And there, you absolutely need a virtual twin or industrial metaverse of that piece of equipment because it's your own money that is in the line. So I see these are, uh, beside the, the KPIs, even business models will evolve. We can take questions from the audience in a minute, but would you, one of you wanted to speak on that? I see a lot of nodding yeah. heads. I, and, <laughs> Let, let me expand on that. I, I, I bring it, I, I maybe extend on that. Um, usually when I, when, I, when I make these use cases and, and talk exactly like you, I see confused faces because we, we talked about metaverse a lot and you acknowledge it, that metaverse usually, what, what people see from a marketing side, right, going back to the hype cycle is, wait, what, why are we talking about digital twins so much? Why are we talking about efficiency, networking and other stuff? Isn't, isn't this, building my factory in Fortnite? <laughs> and the answer is, well, well no. Um, 
here's, here's another provocation. Metaverse in an industrial context is actually part of the Industry 4.0 storyline. Mm -hmm. um, it is, okay, you start with, with connecting, pulling, pulling physical reality and virtuality, then building, contextualizing it, building models and ontologies and creating eventually a digital twin where, you're, where you replicate not only the thing but also processes and people and, and entire environments. But then you have all that. And it, from, from, for all intents and purposes, that's a game level, right? It's, it's the same thing as, as, as a Roth in World of Warcraft, just it ends at your, it ends at your, um, at the gate of your factory. And then you can, you can do all those things where you, where you just gave a couple of great examples. Why don't you use that data so that somebody with AR glasses that is doing maintenance on a machine walks up to a machine and immediately overlays it with the maintenance history, with guidance on how to replace parts, with, with very specific use cases that, again, for all intents and purposes, are the same technologies as I, I walk up to somebody, I shoot him in the face, and I laugh about it. Is very, is, is, very, is very different in terms of consumer terms and in terms of industry terms, where workers are still enabled to have a great experience. It's just not the, I'm, I'm playing a shooter game, it's the, I'm very efficient and great at my job, because technology enabled me to be that. Okay, and we got to go to questions in the audience, and I just want to state that he was talking in a gaming context, not in getting up and actually shooting somebody. So we've got some questions in the audience, I hope. Do we have some questions? Yes, great. Uh, do we have a mic? Somebody's got a mic for you. Thank you. Uh, I have a question, and it's, it's following up from what you said, Philip, around business models. Is when does the value of the digital twin become higher than the physical asset itself? Where do you think that tipping point happens? I think it, it does have a greater value than the physical object itself when you can uh, put all the knowledge and know-how of your company, of your people, of your operators, of your engineers, of your field technicians onto the twin. Because that knowledge and know-how right now is in people's mind usually and we know that we have a uh, retirement issue with people really retiring uh, huge crowd of people retiring soon and and the knowledge will go with them if you if if we are able if our, our customers our companies are able to really organize the knowledge and know-how around the virtual twin then the value is greater than the physical asset itself great do we have a question online as well a few, actually. Um, <laughs> how do the metaverses impact the process of the designing of industrial products? Who's it for? <laughs> Anybody want to take that one? Impact the design of products? Uh, Dietmar, go start. for it. I mean, we were talking about, a lot about producing and m maintaining for the moment. We have also the training, but we have also the engineering and design. And I mean, we have this, this collaboration thing. So if you have different parts from a different vendor pulling together in a 3D model with avatars, whatever, different, different sites, yeah, you, you, can, you can save costs. And you, you see it in the 3D how things work together. That's about product design, but you have also factory design, whatever, city design, and you have the twin on, on different levels, from molecules to, to the universe. Huh? So it's, it's, it's a question of the, 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 the cut data, the 3D data, and, uh, but, th that's, but, but it's not specific on product, so maybe the... I think, the I think also, yeah. it's not only the cut data, it is the, it's, it's the what we call mod sim, modeling and simulation, because you can, you can really construct and simulate mm -hmm. immediately. Mm -hmm. And uh, on top of this, we have now um, arriving generative design, meaning that you are, you are doing, you, you are giving constraints or wishes, and then the, the system, the virtual twin itself is building, is proposing you the best solution, what he believes is the best solution, so we have uh, now AI arriving in the design uh, sphere, especially with generative design. So this is the evolution of the, the, the engineering metaverse that, that 
has been there for decades yeah. and now moving towards generative and modeling and simulation. Excellent. We've May got I add something? Oh, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Um, I think one of the potential of the metaverse, as we say, is that it can bring uh, significant sustainability benefits, uh, exactly as you just mentioned, like uh, dematerialization of the prototypes. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's why we're a big fan of uh, the future mm -hmm. of the industrial metaverse in Nokia, because it's really in our strategy to continue to help uh, the companies and the world to act together and to be more green. That's fantastic. I love the sustainability aspect of it. Uh, Matthias, you had a question. Um, Philippe, you talked about different vendors uh, having uh, machines in uh, a line from an OEM. So standardization must be a topic in there. We didn't discuss that today. So uh, Dietmar, what, mm. what do you s how do you see this on a political level or on a society level? Where are you engaged in this? Yeah, standards. The one who has the standards or the norms has the power. That's for <laughs> sure. Um, we as Fraunhofer own our money also with, with some patents um, and some, some, some standards. Um, going back 40 minutes ago, we said Metaverse is a bundling of diverse technologies to the use cases of factory, whatever. So standards in the Metaverse means interoperability of the plat diverse platforms, meta because it's not the metaverse, it's variable metaverses. It can either be smart contracts or blockchain on, on that level, but also the different codecs, audio, video, data, everything has to be the, the AI platforms behind. That's about the, the stand and they have to be specific per domain because they already have are working with different in the construction business it's different than in the manufacturing so there is for the time being now there's a discussion in berlin and the ministry of digitalization and uh, traffic uh, on that topic and tomorrow is the one with dean and so it's it's a very important issues we have the metaverse standards forum just one sentence which internationally and on a europe and german level we have of course different different opportunities, um, uh, platform economy and, and, and sovereignty issues. Yeah, that's... It's not uh, easily that's solvable, yeah. Dirk. <laughs> and I think beyond those explicit standards, mm -hmm. there need to be a set of implicit agreements or guidelines that we form as a society. Because this goes beyond, again, it's not just a technical problem. It's also things like, um, I mentioned the magic circle earlier. So there are things that are okay in different contexts that are absolutely not okay in other contexts. So there will be things that are fine in virtuality, but not fine in reality. But as we create those stronger links, they're going to be very interesting dynamics as we enter a work context. For example, how if I have an avatar in a work context, is it okay to style it in a way that would not be okay according to the dress code of the company? Is it okay for me as Caucasian white male to present as, I don't know, Raj? <laughs> and and th those are interesting questions that are, well, where in virtuality that my, my skin color is literally a slider and, and, and yes, it might be funny in a South Park game to have that as a difficulty level, but, but in reality, those are, those are very hard questions. It is about things about familiarity. How do we even communicate in that, in that metaverse? If, if, for example, again, remote, access, uh, remote, um, remote, uh, remote assistance mm -hmm. is just similar to a chat. It's literally a chat in a, somebody is, is in a reality, uh, in a real context, the other one is in a virtual context. But, uh, th those are obviously very different contexts than, hey, I, I, I chat to somebody in chat VR. So what are these things? What are these social norms that we decide to bring into virtuality? Maybe overriding some of the experiences and expectations we already have for virtual mm -hmm. um, experience and virtual world. So this is a very interesting thing where we have to discuss as a society and societies on a global scale, and but also on a local scale, what is acceptable and interesting. And the result will not be standards, but more like very intrinsic, very vague norms, ideas, and, and, and guidances. So you're asking really interesting questions because I think you want to say a few more things, right? Yes, <laughs> Go ahead. Because the question was on, on technical, but, but um, as a father of three daughters, um, we have al already a problem with the web point two. Yeah? So now we have web, web three, yeah? and, and it's, 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 it's multiplicating. And the, 
legal and ethical issues are enormous. Yeah, and from a, from a business perspective, okay, first put the use cases and technologies, and then the, the barriers. Yeah, but the the ethical aspects he was mentioning is very 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 important. Yeah, to how far will we go with that? Yeah, and there there is the dark metaverse yeah, is even a, a term. Mm -hmm. yeah, so we have to. Make, make, make many rules, yeah, not only the implicit rules, even explicit rules. And there was a discussion in the Bundestag in December and it went, everything went kreuz und quer. Yeah. So it really is a big issue, uh, the, the, the society and, and, and uh, ethical issues. So yeah. we have the, and that's why all those stakeholder dialects, the Zivilgesellschaft, they also have a share in it. Yeah, and that also technology companies and us nerds. Yeah. We have a long way to go. Yeah. We have another question from online or? <laughs> uh, do you see the consumer metaverse being always separated from the industrial metaverse or do you expect them to merge in the future? Who would like to take that one? I, so, we, we discussed this, uh, well, I mentioned this earlier, the technology per se is the same to an extent. The scale is different, where it's perfectly fine to spend a lot of money to pull one, maybe two machines or factory lines in the metaverse. It is a very different thing to do that hundreds of millions of times for consumer scale devices. It's very different from a, uh, from a communication <laughs> point of view, it's very different from a design point of view. So all of those complexity multiply, but that also means we, we do not have good enough answers to, 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 to do this, well, first of all, technically, but also ethically on a society scale. So it's actually not that different, but the scale gives it a very different quality um, in, in, in terms of the things that we need to think about. So it's not that separate. It's more like it's, uh, it, it feels different. It has a different mm -hmm. gestalt than, Did you want to than the on industry one. At all? No? Okay, go ahead. I mean, um, for the moment or for the time being, we're talking a lot about a consumer metaverse, yeah? or NFTs and blockchains and, and Roblox and so on. So that's, that's what the, the the public is, is is aware of, and in terms of the players behind the platform players, the the Meta is the, 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 the Meta Inc. They, they they do glasses and and some some research, but they they are on the consumer business, and the the platform is consumer. Then we have players platforms in the enterprise sector, and some in the industrial. So so there's a sort of segmentation. The technology is 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 rather the same, but the the, the use cases from from the users in the gaming of course of, of course different but there we have to look at, at subscription rates yeah how it how it develops but it's um for the for the moment it's 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 separated but they 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 will emerge to some level because it's about enterprises about people to people yeah and then yeah, you have have uh, more more dimensions to it but it's more more separate for the moment Okay. Any other questions from the audience? Uh, of course, Tom, go for it. <laughs> I was wondering where you were. <laughs> so actually, uh, building on the last question a bit, or maybe, maybe turning it around, because we're here, I guess, to talk about virtual worlds in the context of you know, factories and industrial use cases. So do you guys think that um, the factory will become a public place? So thinking a little bit about how maybe suppliers to factories will interact with operators' factories, or you know how ecosystems play a role in the creation of these workplaces and operations places. Does this essentially become a marketplace or a, or an open space uh, for the outside world to look into? Or knowing that traditionally factories have been very closed. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not sure it's going to be open to everyone. I think uh, if if the line builder is sharing the twin or the simplified twin with the with the user. It will involve, though, in what aspect that, uh, that is getting the industrial twin closer to the consumer twin is the people. Because you can then, depending on maybe um, the size of the operator, or the strength of the operator, of if the operator uh, can or cannot act uh, a certain way, then you can simulate that operator twin with the machine twin and then adapt the uh, operating instructions or the, the um, service instruction to that operator. So 
uh, I think about the human part of it, the, the, in, in a way the, it will serve the workforce of the future, but first, not publicly, first for the operators themselves, for the field technicians and whoever has at stake uh, from, a, from a workforce uh, standpoint in that um, uh, industrial environment. I love that all the questions for you, Philippe, came from your team. I think that is very ironic. I think they all want your ear. Uh, but we have a couple of minutes left, and I'd love to just let you have one sentence that you'd like to deliver and have the audience go home with. So why don't we start with you, Philippe, and then we'll work our way around. So last takeaway. I think, I think we are... Demand is meeting offer, and our customers are asking us for this virtual twin, especially virtual twin specific in operation for the last two years, two or three years. And we, we are coming up with offers for that, so it, it's a great moment, and I think that it will, go, it will really go further very quickly right now. Excellent. Thank you very much, Dirk. I think we enter. I, I, we're in a moment in time where we enter um, commoditization of this space for very specific things. So not broadly, metaverse, everybody can buy it, but for very specific things within industries, for use cases and scenarios, we enter something or like maturity and commoditization. Um, that means less risk, um, it means very quick return on investment, and it means it's actually transactable instead of having that mess we described earlier. But I think Ultimately, it's important to understand when we talk about metaverse, um, everybody essentially talks about the same. It's still a contested term, and we had that discussion earlier, what does the metaverse actually mean? The answer is currently it's a contested term. It's claimed by many people. It's a narrative where people can, very different people with very different motifs, can put their hopes, dreams, goals, desires into it. So although on one side where we are quite mature, we are now in a position where we can actually formulate, not just as financial institutions or organizations, but also as society, can form it, what should it do for us? What should be the big benefit that not only gives it to an organization in manufacturing, but like mm -hmm. as a society for your three daughters, for my son, what does it actually do? And enable not just us, but future generations. Huh? I think that's very interesting. So both of those things are not necessarily separate. Yeah. Organizations are corporate citizens too, right? And so when, when we engage in these industrial metaverses contexts, it's great to it's it's great place and time to start with very specific use cases, but then expand upon how do we how do we continue building it out, making it bigger, um, and, and, and playing playing more of a corporate citizen role in, in a new like metaverse enabled world. Excellent. Yeah, I think metaverse, the term, we had a debate on calling it virtual worlds or metaverse at one point as well. Please, Dietmar. Yeah, um, I think metaverse is not going away. It will stick. So it's March 23, and we just opened this door this far with a small ray of light. <laughs> and the, the, the number of possibilities and visions are infinite, but we have to, 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 shape, it, to shape it our way. So... So we just start with the metaverse, no matter how we frame it or we, 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 we term it. And then for the industrial thing, uh, from the industrial side, we really have to put this in relationship to the existing concepts of data platforms, of Industry 4.0, and, and they have the use cases. But this is essential to, to, to put this in, in, in the frame. But we have just started. Fantastic. Thank you. I'm a firm believer that uh, soon the, 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 all our uh, customers will ask to digital twin anything. And they will ask also so to, uh, to digital twin the network yeah. that we provide. And this, we need to uh, work together. I don't know yet what is the recipe to orchestrate all of this, because as you said, it will be a system of system. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm sure that there will be new, new players to reflect on this uh, integration to make it uh, real with concrete use case that bring all the potential of the metaverse. 
Fantastic. Thank you very much. So that's another 3D Excite Live wrapped up. Now, uh, thank you to the team here at 3D Experience Lab and the technical team behind the scenes who make this happen. Thank you to our fantastic panelists. Thank I you. think this is a really exciting panel that we had here today. And join us on June 22nd when we'll be hosting our next 3D Excite Live, which will be the generative AI explosion revolutionizing the creative world. Thank you very much and see you then. There's a lot of nodding, you all agree. <laughs>